show. I am your host, Jay Jones. Black Entrepreneur Blueprint was created specifically to educate and inspire black entrepreneurs to launch, build, and grow successful businesses. Join us as we help build an economic power base in the black community by promoting business ownership. If you are currently an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, We invite you to join us every week here at Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, episode number 217. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and today we have a dynamic show in store for you. Today, we're going to be interviewing Mr. Charles Tank Harris, the founder of Charles M. Harris financial services. Now, before we start today's show, you might want to get a pencil and a notepad because Charles dropped some gems on today's show and it's straight fire. Now, before we get to today's episode, I just want to give you a few reminders. Number one, my new book is out, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar Worldwide by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses. So if you're interested in building a successful, sustainable e-commerce business, Go to anewblackwallstreet.com. Pick yourself up a copy. It's $14.95 plus shipping and handling. If you need additional assistance to build your successful and sustainable e-commerce business, you can go and register for my online course, Educated E-Commerce, and you can find that at educatedecommerce.com. I am on the line with Mr. Charles Tank Harris. Brother Charles, how are you this morning? I'm well, Jay, man. How are things with you, brother? I am doing great, man. First and foremost, I want to welcome you to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint Podcast. So we want to thank you first and foremost for spending your time with us so you can share your entrepreneurial journey. It's my honor and privilege to be with you, brother. I appreciate you having me on. Before the people that don't know who you are, give us a little bit of background about yourself, and then we're going to jump into your entrepreneurial journey. I appreciate that. So uh, my name is Charles Tank Harris. I am a Philadelphia native. I claim Philly. I did do a stint of about eight years down in Atlanta. I uh, had a business down there, which we'll get into throughout the course of the, the interview, I suppose. But I'm a Philly guy, born and raised 13 different schools for my public education. I'm a Temple Owl alum, love my TU Owls. And, you know, I, my background is that of a, of a servant, truthfully. And I've chosen to serve in the financial realm. I've worked with uh, professional athletes small business owners, churches, civic organizations and unions, just really trying to spread the, the mantra of financial literacy and, and to close the racial wealth gap by just making sure people have the tools. Because as it says in the Bibles, our people, our, our people, la- they perish from lack of knowledge, not just because they won't do right, but in a lot of instances because they don't know how to do right. So that that's a little bit about me. All BEB family members, you know, we, we rep in Philly here. That's my TU alumnus right here. So we got to definitely get that out on the air right there. No doubt. Brother Charles, now, did you go straight to entrepreneurship after college or did you do corporate America first? So that's a great question. I When I was in college, I had my first two children. So for me, when I got out of school, the primary focus was an income. So I went into corporate America working for Ford Motor Credit Company. And even with a a, a lovely, illustrious degree from Temple University, uh, my first job was collecting car notes uh, for delinquent delinquent borrowers for Ford Motor Credit. And that was something that just was not up to snuff for me. And it made me start to look into different entrepreneurial opportunities and my next step was kind of a bridge between corporate and entrepreneurial. It was working for Solomon Smith Barney as a stockbroker. So the reason I say that's a bridge, I'm still at a corporate entity being at Solomon Smith Barney. But when you're a stockbroker, you are basically running your own practice as a financial advisor. So I got my first taste of what it was to work for myself 
at Solomon Smith Barney, which would eventually lead me to full outright entrepreneurship. That makes a lot of sense, man. And I tell people that are coming out from college that I consult with, sometimes it's good to go into corporate America because when you do leave, you know exactly what you're leaving. When you come out and you go straight into entrepreneurship, you may always have that doubt in your mind. Well, maybe I should have gone to corporate. Maybe I should have done this. But when you go experience corporate, my, my oldest daughter is doing it right now. So she's experiencing corporate. I told her, go ahead and do that. Get everything you can. Leverage all the assets that you can and learn everything you can. And then if you're ready and you want to step out on your own, then you'll know, hey, I did there, did that, been there, and now I'm on my own. When you made that transition, tell me about what it was like. Well, I went from Smith Barney to Payne, Payne Weber. Weber. That's right. Okay. Now. And in doing that, you know, it was funny because what I also noticed when I got to Smith Barney, it was just called Smith Barney. Within two weeks of being there, they merged with Solomon Brothers and became Solomon Smith Barney. And a similar experience happened to me when I went to Payne Weber. Uh, within a month of being at Payne Weber, UBS acquired Payne Weber and it became UBS Financial Services. So I saw a lot of the mergers and acquisition side of financial services, which just piqued my interest about why companies bought each other, merged with each other, spun each other off. And it really just quenched, you know, a, a, a desire inside of me to learn more about the industry and then to one day pursue my own, you know, broker dealer and uh, insurance brokerage. It makes it makes a whole lot of sense with that that natural progression. Now, I want you to take us into the mind of Charles Tank Harris the first day after you leave your corporate job as a stockbroker and when you opened your first business. And if you can just tell us what that first business was and then take us into into the mind of Charles Tank Harris and what you were thinking when you were like, you know what, this is it. I'm on my own. And, and just let the BEB family know where you were mentally at that at point in time. Oh, uh, well, I, I tell everybody, make sure you buckle up when you're in the mind of Charles <laughs> Tank Harris. It's a carnival up in there. But uh, so for me, when I was at, when I, so going through the brokerage firm channel, I got my start in financial services because my best friend was a professional athlete. And we had went to college together, played college ball together. When I was at Ford Motor Credit, I didn't like the job. I, I took an opportunity that uh, to look in the Ford manual and see that they offered tuition reimbursement. So I started graduate school. In when I was in graduate school, also at Temple, I got the call from my best friend to become his financial advisor, and that was what really set me on the path of getting into that space. So he was my first client, and I got to kind of backtrack in the story a little bit to okay. to, to to tell people how. I was able to achieve success in the financial services space because it truly wasn't cut out for someone like me to succeed. Um, I grew up on food stamps. Uh, I, I was born in the projects. My mom got us out the projects within the first year of my life. So I don't remember living in the projects, but my family all still lived in the projects and I would go there, you know, raised, bounced around from house to house in, in West and Southwest Philly. So I didn't come from an environment of inherent wealth. Mm -hmm. And when you go to work for a firm like Smith Barney, back when I was there, the account minimums for the program that I was in was a quarter million dollars. And I didn't know anybody who had a quarter million dollars at the time, or at least I didn't think I had access to people like that. So I would have never pursued that career had I had a full understanding of what I was getting into, because where would I want to open up accounts for people who had a quarter million dollars? Well, fortunately for me, when I was at Temple and I was my foray into sports ended quickly with a knee injury, I became a tutor in the academic advisement department for athletes. And as a result, I tutored all of the guys who ended up going to the NBA and the NFL from Temple in the 90s. And when I got to Smith Barney and my first client was my best friend, Trey Johnson, word quickly got out amongst the other NFL and NBA Temple alum that I was in this industry, and they actually pursued me to be their advisor. So I really quickly built up a, a, a strong clientele with professional athletes. What the good, that's the good news. <laughs> okay. the, the, the kind of bad news to that was my athlete clients, who are also, you know, all my friends, you know, and considered them brothers and family, they weren't very comfortable with the traditional stock market. 
they weren't very comfortable buying 100 shares of, of a stock and watching it go up and down. They wanted to do things that they had a better understanding of. Being from inner city environments themselves, they wanted to buy dilapidated row homes, renovate them, and rent them out or sell them. They wanted to open up a barber shop or a beauty salon for their aunt. They wanted to buy a franchise. And I, as their financial advisor, I facilitated all of that for them. Well, I got a call into the office one day from my manager at Payne Weber, and he was remarking on the fact that I had about $20 million in client assets sitting in money market accounts, and nobody had bought any stocks or bonds. And he asked me what was going on. And, I, and, and me not knowing any better, I explained to him what I just told you. Mm-hmm. Hey, my clients don't want to buy stocks and bonds. They don't, they don't like that stuff. That's not what, what they understand. So I'm helping them do these business things outside of Payne Weber because I'm their financial advisor. And that's when I really quickly learned that a financial advisor is only a name only in those types of industries. When you're in the financial services industry, working for a corporate firm, and I work for a corporate firm now, and we'll get into that as we move forward. Okay. I'm partners with New York Life. Uh, when you work for these types of firms or work with these types of firms, the way they make their revenue is selling financial products. Uh, and in selling financial products, you should be giving advice, and the great advisors do, but the bottom line is made for these companies by selling products. I wasn't selling a product. I was giving advice and helping my clients grow themselves financially and business-wise that was going in direct you know, uh, opposition to what my purpose was as far as Payne Weber was concerned. So I had to make a choice. Actually, I was told to make a choice as to whether I wanted to stay at Payne Weber, sell stocks and bonds, or whether I wanted to advise my clients on how they could grow themselves as business people and, and just in general as philanthropic contributors to society. So I made the latter choice. And what I did was I called my top five athlete clients. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in February of 2001. I called my top five athlete clients and I asked them, I said, hey, look, you see what I'm doing for you? I'm basically serving as a business manager. I'm not serving as a stockbroker because we don't own any stocks or bonds. I'm managing your business life. I'm helping you with your personal finances. Mm -hmm. I said, how would you guys feel about me breaking off from Payne Weber, starting my own company, and managing all of your financial affairs? I'm talking about if you go to a car dealership one night and want to buy a car, you call me and I tell you whether to lease or to get a car note or pay cash. I sit with the dealer and negotiate the discount. If you're getting a mortgage, I'll introduce you to the mortgage broker. Any of these things, I will be the point person managing your finances, and I will help you hire the Payne Webbers and Merrill Lynch's of the world because that's what I used to do, and I know exactly what you should be looking for. And there was just an overwhelming, joyful response. People were like, that's what we want from you, Tank. That's what we want you to do. So... I then also asked on that same call, how much would you pay me to do this? And it was really spooky. I've I've told the story a hundred times. Each of the five guys, without having an opportunity to talk to each other, all gave me the same number. They all said they would pay me $50,000 a year to do that. Mm -hmm. So I have five people offering me $50,000 a year, quarter million bucks. As a stockbroker at that point, I was making about $180, $190. I was like, well, heck. I can go from having hundreds of clients and making less than 200 grand, go down to having five clients and make a quarter million. This seems like a no brainer to me. So I counted the guys and this is going to sound like I'm not a great businessman, but I like to believe I am. <laughs> All right. I, count, I countered the guys downward. I said, Hey, look, you're willing to pay me 50. Instead of paying me 50, you pay me 30, pay me $2,500 a month, monthly fee and 10% of any money I make you, or 10% of any money I save you. And they were like, that's even better, Tank. And I said, now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the deal with you guys now. Right. As you succeed, I succeed. And it, it was basically, I took my sales assistant uh, who was working for me at Payne Weber, who knew all those clients. She came with me. She started you know, helping everybody with their bill pay and just working with the moms and the wives and the girlfriends. She, she added that female touch that was needed. Mm-hmm. And I started athletic business management in March of 2001 with my top five brokerage clients and you know, the rest of they say is history. Now let me ask you real quick, because 
on that first day that you you opened your office and you were rocking and rolling, I guess you did have a sense of of security because you didn't start from scratch. So you actually migrated five of your top clients over. So but what did it feel like when you were literally out there on your own as opposed to being under the umbrella of a UBS? Well, you know what? I've never felt any different, to be completely honest with you. When I was working at UBS and Smith Barney before that, I had crafted uh, uh, an identity that looked a lot different from the other advisors at Smith Barney. And in fact, you know, one of the things I want to get into, because I'm a big proponent of mental health and mental health aware awareness, what I realized when I was at Smith Barney was that I started to suffer from depression. And I don't even want to blame it on Smith Barney or the industry. <laughs> okay. I, I have always suffered from depression. Let me say that. Okay. I've been in therapy since I was a child. And it just got worse when I was at Smith Barney. I, uh, I read an article on a basketball player, Kendall Gill, oh, yeah. who was suffering from depression. And I said to myself, Could I, even though I had been diagnosed early as a child, I never took the diagnosis seriously. I always really equated depression with being unhappy. Now I'm old enough, educated enough, and, and experienced enough to know they are two different things. I could be dancing around with a smile on my face and still be depressed. Right. So what, I was trying to understand how Kendall Gill, who was a successful young, and I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a heterosexual male, but I'm comfortable in my masculinity, so I'll say this. He was an attractive brother. He, you know, he seemed to have everything going for himself. And I'm trying to figure out why is this dude depressed? Right. And then I experienced it myself. I'm at Smith Barney. I'm making more money than I ever dreamt I would make. I'm pulling up uh, in a brand new car. I'm hobnobbing with people who, who wouldn't otherwise have me at their table. Mm -hmm. And yet I was miserable. And so what I ended up doing was kind of carving out my own space. I, I didn't go to the office very often. i never wore a suit and tie. I was always very casual. And what I did was because I had so many professional athlete clients, my business model was to basically go and spend a week or two at a time with each player that was my client so that I could show their teammates how much service I gave them and pick up further, more clients. Mm -hmm. So I crafted my own thing. I never felt like when I worked at Smith Barney and Payne Weber, I almost can honestly say that I never felt like I worked there. Um, I didn't sell people on Smith Barney. I didn't sell people on Payne Weber. I sold people on Tank. And because I was 100% commissioned, it, you know, it really wasn't like I ever felt I had security or comfort at those firms. So when I turned it over to athletic business management and had my own ship, the, it wasn't scary. It wasn't a situation where I felt like, oh my God, now I don't have the the comfort of having an office or the comfort of having staff or the comfort of having a salary. And I think that's the biggest shaky point for most people when they become entrepreneurs, right. they're giving up security in exchange for opportunity. Well, I already had given up security when I became a stockbroker going from Ford credit to Smith Barney was the financially risky part with two young children getting from Smith Barney into Payne Weber and then Payne Weber into athletic business management, there was no additional risk in my mind. So it wasn't really scary. But I want to touch on something that you, you said about your clientele. Instead of taking the $50,000, you took $2,500 a month for what, 12 months and you mm -hmm. would get a percentage of their savings or their growth in their investments. Now, mm -hmm. my, my question to you was, is this, did you feel that it would be more uh, palatable for your clients to pay you that way as opposed to giving you a $50,000 lump sum each year? Was that, did that come into play? Definitely came into play for, for them and for me. So, you know, even as a financial advisor, there's, there's an old adage in, in that I've experienced through life and heard through life that what we do professionally for other people, we do worst for ourselves. Uh, if you meet a lawyer, he's got his own legal problems. Meet an accountant, he's got tax issues. Meet a mechanic, he got a clunker out in front of his house. So I have I have resembled that comment. I am, I, I've changed it now. I'm almost 50 now, so I had to get serious with life. But through my early career, I was horrible with my own money because I was living the life of do as I say, not as I do. I spent all my time investing myself 
in how to make other people's financial situation better and never made my own financial situation better. As a result, I knew really early on, if somebody gave me a check for 50 grand, probably two, three months later, that money was gone. Then I got to figure out life from there. So it made sense for me on a cash flow basis to be paid monthly. But I could have told them to take the 50 divided by 12 and pay me 4,000 and change monthly. Why did I drop it down to 2,500? I did it for two reasons. A, it, it, it's salesmanship. You know, if somebody is willing to pay you 50 and you tell them they, they, you're going to take 30, even when you throw the 10%, which I knew would, would I'm, I'm very proud of what I do and I'm very good at what I do. So I knew the 10% would more than make up for what I was sacrificing in the guarantee. Uh, it, it, it builds camaraderie. It builds a partnership with your client. That client tells that story the same way I tell that story. They say, yo, my guy, I was willing to pay him 50. He only took 30. They only, they almost don't even mention the 10% part right. that ends up making sure that I made more than 50. They just say, my guy took 30 instead of 50. And that salesmanship, you know, early on in my career, I like to say it was a stroke of genius on my part to, to anticipate and understand the reaction that that was going to get me when I offered it to these particular clients. That makes a lot of sense. And and you and I both know when you're dealing with, with athletes, entertainers, people are always trying to get something from them. You know, oh, you know, mm-hmm. you got these relatives that, that you haven't seen in 55 years and they're coming out the woodwork because they got to pay their rent. Everybody coming and approaching them with business ideas and opportunities. So that made a whole lot of sense, man, the way you, you came at it from a uh, partnership type of mentality as opposed to this is what you pay me but hey you know i got some skin in the game too because i'm going to make generate revenues based on how well i do for you saving you money or also making you money so beb family the light bulb should be going off here so if you can partner with your clients as opposed to taking from your clients now we all know that we're going to provide services and, and and you know opportunities for your clients but being able to partner with them that's a win-win on both sides. Now, you kind of touched on this a little earlier, but uh, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, how did you finance your business? Was it through those first five clients or did you have something put aside prior to that when you made your transition? Well, it was basically through the money that I got when I switched from Smith Barney to Payne Weber. There was a there was an amount of money paid to me. Uh, and that, it was funny. Because once again, I've already shared that I grew up in in financial dire straits. So when I left Smith Barney, Payne Weber gave me a check for $240,000 to come on board. That was an upfront payment with another payment of $80,000 on the first day of the second year if I had moved 75% of my business over. So when they gave me that $240,000, man, I went down to the bank and tried to cash the check instead of depositing it. <laughs> I wanted to take <laughs> I wanted to see two hundred and forty thousand dollars in cash and put it on my bed. Well, you know, that's, that's another podcast. Never mind. <laughs> so what I did was um I kept some of that money. Uh I also by the time I left I had already gotten the eighty thousand as well. So I had a little bit of savings to pay my sales assistant who became my right hand person at athletic business management. So I, and that with the monthly cash flow from the client fees, pretty much was how I financed the first the first business. Oh, that that makes a lot of sense, man. Would you think you were Money Mayweather, man? You're going to the bank. You had your your, your sack over there over your shoulder. Yeah, I, I had my <laughs> backpack. I was ready to stuff it full of dough, ready to stuff it up. Oh man, yeah. That but see, that's a nice transition. So it wasn't like a, a lot of entrepreneurs, and and I'm going to include myself in this. I remember my first business I started, man, I was on a, on a shoestring budget uh, trying to manage and maintain everything. So when you're able to transition and have a little bit of something to fall back on, I, sh- I know that makes it a little bit more comfortable for you to, to be able to do that when you know you have something to fall back on. I wanted to ask you real quick, Tank, what would be three pieces of advice that you would offer to someone that's thinking about starting a business today? Well, the first thing I tell anybody, because as a business manager, a large part of what I did was teaching my clientele how to become entrepreneurs, how to start their own businesses, how to transition from the sport they were in to life after the sport that they were in, whether it was to run their own foundation or to do something for profit. 
And the number one thing that I tell everybody is to find something you're passionate about. You know, and it's funny because I'm listening to an audio book right now by from a guy named Sean Anker or Aker. He's a happiness studier uh, up at uh, Harvard University. He was the keynote speaker at a conference I just came from, and I'm listening to his audio book. And he talks about how in life we're taught that success begets happiness, that if you achieve a certain level of success academically, professionally, romantically, it'll make you happy. And all evidence shows that that is not true. What, because once we achieve something, and, and it's another psychological principle at work there, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, once we achieve something, we move our goal to want to achieve right. something new. So you actually, if you, you're at that, the, the hamster on the, uh, the, the wheel, you never actually achieve that happiness because you keep moving the target. The reality is, is that you should seek out happiness. And once you're a happy person, you're more likely to, to attain higher levels of success. That's the premise behind his book, and I'm in agreement with it, which is why I'm listening to it. So to that, I say, if you're going to get into an entrepreneurial endeavor, you want to do something that you're passionate about, something that's going to sustain you even when the money isn't matching up with your efforts. Because being an entrepreneur can be lonely. Being an entrepreneur can be, you know, the, one of the most misunderstood occupations you can have because you're in it for yourself a lot of the time. And the money doesn't always match up with the hustle and the muscle. And you know that. And your listeners know that. So through those times where the money isn't there, you have to make sure your passion is being fed. That's the number one thing I tell people. The second thing could, could be viewed as running contrary to the first, but I don't think it does. The second thing I learned from my, my mentor in my mind, uh, A.G. A. Gaston, who uh, is, is an OG of making money post-slavery. A.G. Gaston, Black Titan, one of his principles was find a need and fill it. So yep. if you just don't jump up and say, hey, I'm passionate about pruning trees and I'm going to open up a tree pruning business, then you look around and you say, you know what? I see where these cars, when they park under trees, they get a lot of bird residue on them. I'm going to make a certain type of wax that you can put on your car so that the bird residue doesn't mess up your paint job. Now, you, I doubt there's very many people who are passionate about that, but they can see that right. need and they feel that need. So those are the two things that I, that's my one-two punch for entrepreneurs who are looking to, to become entrepreneurs or stay in the game. It's find a need and fill it and definitely do something you're passionate about. All right. You got, you have one more, man. You got a third. Anything you want to add to that? What I would say is you always want to do something. Now, you know, this is a combination. So, so you know, you, 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 you're making me dig deep in my bag right here. None of this is, <laughs> none of this is written down, but I'm a, I'm a. That's off- what Jay Jones does, <laughs> baby. I, I, I know that. I'm an authentic <laughs> person, so it's going to come off my lips authentically. My third one would be a combination of the two. So if the first one is to find something you're passionate about and do that, and the second one is to find a need and to fill it, the third one would be, to do something that betters the world. That always sounds corny, so I don't lead with that. But if you're doing something, you know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. You know, if you're doing something yeah. that betters the world, everybody, you know, loves somebody. You know, everybody has somebody, right. whether it's a child or a relative or a love, you know, a, a, a lover. And you want to make the world not just good for you, but for that person. So if you can do something as an entrepreneur that ends up benefiting society as a whole, you know, nine times out of 10, you'll be passionate about that thing. And it, it, there's a need you're filling because you're making the world a better place. So that would be the third to round off my top three list. Now I got to make a, make a point to, to commit that to writing for myself <laughs> and, and hanging above my desk. You had talked about it earlier. It's, it's about service. That's what we're here for. Mm-hmm. We're here to serve. And uh, so that definitely fulfills that. Now, as entrepreneurs, my listeners, they know there's good times and bad times. So, Tank, can you tell us about a specific time in your business where you failed or had a setback? And what did you learn from it? And how did you overcome it if you did overcome it? Ooh, so I've had many setbacks and failures. <laughs> how much time do we have? That's, so now let's go. That's and, part of the game. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that is part of the game. And the, 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 if you are looking for a smooth ride, if you're looking for a steady upward trajectory, uh, entrepreneurship may not be for you. Uh, I, and it's funny because I'm bringing my daughter, my oldest daughter into the business. And one of the things we talk about over and over again 
is mindset. And her mindset is very conservative. Her mindset is very risk adverse. She also, though, offers some very, you know, she's a very intelligent, well-educated young lady, you know, thanks to dad paying for all that college. And <laughs> there's some advantages to bringing her into the practice that I see off the top. Plus, she's my legacy. So I, I want her in the practice. But I definitely spend a lot of time trying to encourage her to not look for uh, predictability to not look for things to go the way you think they're going to go, to be prepared to, to keep your head on a swivel and go in another direction at a, at a moment's notice. And that's something we, we consistently go back and forth with as I'm bringing her up to speed. But to your point about a failure, the one I'll harp on, the one that jumps out of mind is I had, so when I first formed that athletic business management in 2001 and was working with some athletes, I was blessed to have come across, a person who would become my business partner, my guy, Sean G, who at the time was running G Financial Group. And he was a business manager solely for entertainers, artists, music artists, things of that nature, um, out of the Philadelphia area primarily. And he was looking to get into the sports side of things. I was looking to have a little more structure to my business because once I left mm -hmm. Payne Weber and started ABM, I was working from my house. I was playing more golf than I ever played before in my life. Uh, I was, I was just, I was doing my job, but I also, I'm very good at enjoying myself. And I was enjoying myself quite a bit working from home in shorts and t-shirt every day. So I was looking for a way to take my business to the next level, as we always say, and partnering with Sean was a great way to do that. So we partnered in 2006 and formed the sports and entertainment financial group. And SESG, as we affectionately called it, grew immediately. We started to, to add some of the biggest names in sports and entertainment that the world knows. And when you have that type of growth, you have growing pains. So for me, right. it, was, it was the handling the bandwidth was the first thing, you know, when Facebook first came out, it kept shutting down the servers. They said they, they weren't prepared for the number of people who wanted to be on it. And most people will say that's a good problem to have. I am such a service-minded person. Customer service is extremely important to me. It, it makes me nauseous to think of someone not getting a good experience from working with me. And as a result of that, when I didn't have the capacity to handle all the growth that I, that I was getting, I quickly had to remedy that because it was too much for me to think of somebody going back and saying, oh, we tried to use SEFG and and they, they didn't answer our calls or they couldn't make this meeting and they stood us up. So that was something that was, was a little troubling. When I think about, to answer the question more directly, when I think about the biggest setback that I had in business, I had a client, and he'll remain nameless, um, I had a client that I, I considered to be my favorite and most profitable and my best client. Uh, he, he was one of the biggest name clients I had ever had. And he made a lot of money. I helped this client save millions of dollars over the course of our working together and make millions of dollars over the course of us working together. And as a result, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had a real estate deal. So remember this year that I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I had a real estate deal that was oh, going yeah. on in 2007. <laughs> and, um, the real estate deal, this, this athlete was not on the deal. I had six other athletes on the deal. This athlete was not one. I had hired real estate consulting firms. I had belts and suspenders this whole deal because it was the first deal that I had ever brought to my players. Now, that's important to understand. As a business manager, I never bought deals to my guys. I vetted the deals that were bought to them. And this was the first one that was my deal. I said, hey, this is going to work for you guys. You should do it. I had a bunch of athletes already signed on. My favorite slash biggest client was in my office one day. I had to deal with some paperwork for that particular uh, investment. And I just turned to him and said, hey, man, how would you like to make $50,000? I remember the conversation so vividly. He said, what do you mean? I said, I can add you onto this deal that's already funded, already done just add you as a, as a signature guarantor and make 
you get $50,000 of the profits when the deal sells because the other athletes would be happy that you're on it. And, you know, I can justify you getting $50,000 just for signing on. He said, cool. It was you know just that quick. Uh, the one thing that I didn't realize, and I, I always take responsibility when responsibility is due, at that point in time, my experience in, in, in signature guarantors was that everybody who signed on was equally responsible for any debt that occurred. So if the deal went belly up, everybody would be one seventh responsible. Cause like I said, I had six guys on already. He was the seventh person. I did not know. And, and once again, I it's just something I've lived and learned that with experience that it's the lender's right to pick any of the guarantors to go after individually. They don't have to say it's wow. equally uh, spread out. So, but it didn't matter to me at the time, nor did it matter to this guy because, when I tell you the deal had 40% debt to equity ratio, and you don't ever see that on real estate deals. Normally it's 80% uh, debt, 20% equity. Mm -hmm. I had 40% debt, 60% equity in the deal. It was, um, it was just a really good opportunity. And then 2008 happened. And anything that had the words real and estate on it blew up. <laughs> and this thing. Tell yeah, me about it. You know I know. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> no secret. So it blew up and the deal was no longer sexy. The values dropped down and the bank called the loan. And because this particular guy had the most robust contract of any of the players on the deal, they went after him solely for the money. And, you know, he wow. was pissed. And I understand. Now, here's the ironic thing. Here's the, here's the right. funny part of the story. Because he had so much money, he ended up buying the property from the bank. So he, he, he did come out of pocket. He ended up, for a deal that he was told he would never spend a dime on, he just had to put his name on it, he ended up having to buy it from the bank. It cost him like a million dollars. But he had a hundred million dollars. So, you know, not that I ever spend anybody else's money, but he had the money. And more importantly, which is why cash flow is so important in business, he had the ability to wait out the, 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 the debacle, which was 2008. Yeah. So he just held the property. And from my understanding, I don't do business with the cat anymore. He ended up selling the property for $6 million. So he ended up making money mm. on something that was a nightmare to right. start out with because not to any benefit of what I did, but he had the financial strength to wait it out. Um, but we never spoke again. He fired me. He sued me. Fortunately, I, I was not found to be liable in the lawsuit because exactly what I said to you is what I did. I had errors and omissions insurance, which covered my legal fees and, and uh, we ended up settling to cover his legal fees. But there was, um, there, there, that was probably my biggest failure. That, to me, showed me that business is always just business. I thought me and this guy were outside of business. I thought we were friends. I realized very quickly we were not friends. We, were, you know, we just had a business relationship. But also the reputation risk that happened as a result of that, because he was disgruntled. He told everybody who would listen, and I get it. Trust me when I say I get it. So right. my problem was that he told people stuff that wasn't true. He told people I stole his money. He told people that I messed his money up. And if he had told the real right story, I'd have been right next to him co-signing it. But he didn't. And he never told people in the end that he made more money than he lost, um, that he ever spent, rather. So that was one of my biggest setbacks. It hurt me moving forward because there were other athletes that I was trying to bring on as clients that anytime he got word that I was after a particular client to sign them, he made it his point to contact that athlete and tell him why they didn't want to deal with me. And it really, really wow. hurt my business and, and, you know, didn't destroy my business, but it hurt my business. What it really did was it tainted my desire to continue to work with athletes. Cause I realized that, there's nothing you can do good for them. The ones that I dealt with uh, after my original five had kind of moved on and retired from sports, the new breed of athletes, as I would call them, there was nothing that you could do that was thankful. You know, if you saved them $100,000, that was what you were supposed to do. But if you did something right. that cost them $2,000, oh, my God, you were the devil and you're out to get them and, and they're telling everybody and their mom and, and you should never work again. And then there's the obvious concern yeah. that I always had with the color barrier. You would think that as an African-American in the business, you would get compassion from your African-American clients. That was never the case. 
there was nothing that I could do that was right. But if someone who was of the non-African American persuasion made a mistake, it was just, oh, they just had a bad day. And I didn't, I didn't, yeah, good. Good. I didn't right. like that about the business at all either. It's funny. And you and I have talked about this off the air many a time. The people you do the most for seem to appreciate it the least. And it's unfortunate when you're dealing in that sector, the financial services sector, and just like me being in the mortgage business and also being a former financial consultant slash stockbroker, when somebody doesn't really understand what the, the process or the transaction is, you can tell them. But if they don't grasp that, then they're speaking from from a place of, of ignorance, not being stupid but not knowing exactly how this transaction works and everything that goes with it. And if they feel that, oh, well, this guy didn't do this for me, and, and now he's besmirching your name. But it really came down, I think, from a, a lack of understanding what the transaction was and what were the repercussions. So it's, uh, it's, it's crazy, man. That's why I got out of the mortgage business. You, you know, bro, because a lot of times you had, oh, my loan didn't close. Well, yeah, didn't I tell you not to buy that car two days before your loan was going to no close? Doubt, no <laughs> doubt. And your debt to income ratio <laughs> got blown up and you're going to blame me. Oh, man, it was it was stressful, brother. And I know you were dealing with the same thing. So let's talk about your transition after athletic business management. And where did you go from there? So, like I said, athletic business management became the sports and entertainment financial group. Uh, with my boy, Sean G. Right. I eventually moved to Atlanta and opened up the sports and entertainment financial group, Sports. So we, we, we segregated sports and entertainment um, because even the situation with that particular client caused a rift between me and my partner. So I ended up moving to the Atlanta area uh, for personal reasons as well. The, the real estate was a lot more affordable down there. By that point in time, my family had grown to six kids and you know there were some college opportunities down there that were uh, much more financially favorable to me. I did that business. Um, I hired a really good young fella, uh, my boy, Mark Riley, shout out to Mark, uh, who basically ran the day-to-day of SEFG Sports while I was the face of it. I was out meeting with agents, meeting with players, meeting with moms and AAU coaches and, and all of that good stuff. And he handled the, the business end of things. And when I got to the point where I started to realize that I didn't want to do it anymore. It was good because I was truly able to hand the business over to Mark. He runs the business to this day under a different name. He runs it under MR Financial, named after his initials. And I found myself trying to figure out what to do next. Um, It came to a point where when I had revenues at one point of a half a million dollars a year with my sports practice, and it had dropped all the way down to 200, 210 a year, and that was basically just enough to pay my staff. So it came to a point where I wasn't making enough money to have the lifestyle that um, that I desired to have. And that was when I fell back on my old mathematical skills. Uh, I was an actuarial science major in college for a brief stint before I ended up switching over to finance and graduating with a finance degree from Temple. I've always been very, very good at math. So I did what every good mathematician should do. I counted cards. Uh, so... I, uh, I did a brief stint as a, I, I like to call it a semi-professional blackjack player. I, I started a, in everything that I do, I do it in a business format. So I got financing um, the same way a poker player kind of gets staked and goes and plays in tournaments and goes around and makes poker money. I was doing it on the blackjack mm-hmm. front using um, a, a couple of systems that I had learned along the way. Um, as the, as I have an interesting story, man, one day it probably will be a book, but just coincidentally, my sales assistant at Payne Weber, who became my right-hand person at athletic business management in the early years, she'll remain nameless too, but she married a guy who was the son of the top card counter in the history of America. Uh, this guy has had TV wow. shows about him, books written about him, and he, he had trained a blackjack club. And I, I learned some things from, from my experience and time with them. And I took it on the road. And, I, and once again, this is when I use racism to my advantage because I don't think there was a casino <laughs> in the world that thought a black guy, especially a big, you know, football player looking black guy like myself was intelligent enough to be in there doing what I was doing. But I was able to support myself and my family over a three year period solely from playing cards. And you're bad. You know, 
I, I, it's funny because <laughs> yeah. there, there's some negative connotations that come with playing cards and being in casinos and, oh, thanks, gambling. And I never considered it gambling, just, that, just like I don't consider it casino gambles. Casinos don't gamble. Casinos offer you games exactly. that are in their favor, and they want you to come play all day. Well, I found the game that I could exactly. make in my favor, and I played it all day because um, blackjack is a beatable game mm-hmm. if you have certain skills, which I brought to the table. Uh, I was getting too wrapped up in that life. I, I was in Vegas every weekend, running around with women I shouldn't have been running around with, uh, just basically <laughs> living a lifestyle that was not uh, not conducive to being the family man that I was supposed to be at the crib. And also, right. I also started to get banned from casinos because I was winning too much. I was never labeled a card counter. Um, I'm glad to say I was labeled a skilled player. And I started to get banned from casinos, and I started the same credit that I was running my operation on started to get frozen. And that caused real problems for me in the card playing. Like any other business, if you have a $500,000 right. cash, cash flow, flow line and your number one lender says, oh, we're not giving you any money, I don't care if you're refurbishing tires, you can't refurbish tires that week. Because you don't have any money to pay your, right. you know, your travel, your delivery people, your staff. And that's what happened to me with the card playing. So I started to see that, that you know, the house does find a way to always win. If they can't beat you on the table, they'll try to do, do something else to ban you or, or cut your cash flow. So I started to look at what I could do next that was more reputable. Um, I didn't have to explain it to people because, once again, people have their mind made up. You tell them you're going to the casino. They know they go to the casino and gamble and lose. They're assuming that's what you're doing. Right. Uh, so I looked into public speaking because I love talking and I love educating. And I did start to build a nice public speaking roster, so to speak. But the money was just not enough compared to what I was used to earning. So I found myself back in familiar territory in financial services. I had a guy who's now my managing partner over at New York Life, the New York Life office I partner with, who had been one of the advisors that I referred my clients to when I was a business manager. He had become a friend. I was actually advising him on a, a, on a decision to go from being uh, a rep at New York Life to being a manager. And while we were having those conversations, it came out that I was looking to make a career change. And he said, come to New York Life, man, you'll love it. I did. I came on board in February of 2013. And like the true entrepreneur that I am, I immediately set out, started my own uh, division and got contracted with about 20 different insurance companies. I now have a voluntary benefits practice. And and I also do financial education, financial seminars on literacy. And I'm also coming out with a children's book on uh, finances. So I've just continued to let the entrepreneurial spirit guide me, but I stayed in what I consider to be my lake, which is financial services. That's an amazing story. Now, I've known you for years. I never knew, man, that you were playing blackjack like that. That's the only game that I play when I go to the casinos. I, I love the skill. People think that that don't play blackjack, like you mentioned, there is skill yep. to it. That's one of the only, actually the only game that I actually play in the casino. I don't play the slots. I love playing blackjack. And the problem is, man, you know how it is. If you get on the table with people that don't know how mm. to play, it's, it's a bad day, mm-hmm. man. It's a bad You know, <laughs> it's going to be It's funny ugly. you say that. It's funny <laughs> you say that. And I love blackjack and I love talking about it. I have learned, though, you know, just because people are ignorant and ignorant does, isn't a bad word. Ignorant just means you don't know something. People think ignorant is indignant, which is two different things. Um, people right. are ignorant to, to what you just said. Blackjack is a skilled game. You can take the advantage from the house and put it on your side of the table. Um, but I don't like to talk about it in business because it's just too much of a hurdle to overcome explaining people that. They think if you play blackjack, you're a risk taker, you're going to lose all their money, or you're going to take their money and take it to the casino. It's stupid, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. But I'll say this. I, when I was studying, and I studied blackjack as – feverishly as I studied financial services, as feverishly as I studied actuarial science, I became a student of blackjack before I ever started to play seriously. And everything that I've ever read says that even though emotionally what you feel is right, that playing with people who don't know what they're doing is bad, the books all consistently say that's not true. They say for every, yeah, really? for every dumb non so. So here's the thing with blackjack, and you know this if, if you've been, you know, studying it the way you said. Blackjack has a mm-hmm. move 
that you should do for every situation. There is no guesswork right. to blackjack. There is no hunch to blackjack. There is, if these cards are in front of you and the dealer's card is this, you do this. A monkey can play blackjack. So it's called basic strategy. And right. with basic strategy, there will always be people who don't follow it. And that's what you mean when you say people who don't play right. Yeah. So exactly. what the yeah. book that I have read say is that for every dumb move that somebody makes that makes your hand not win when it should have, they'll do a dumb move mm -hmm. that makes your hand win when it shouldn't have. So, in the, okay, so it evens out. out. It does not feel that way when you have $5,000 on, on 20. You got 20 in front of you. The dealer has a six showing. And you're like, okay, statistically, I have an 84% <laughs> chance of winning this hand. The guy in front of you also has like 16, and he decides to hit it right. instead of letting the deal. Take and the he hit. takes exactly. the 10. And when the dealer flips over their bottom card, they also have a 10. So they have 16, and their next card that they get is a 5. And it should have been that 10 that that Man. other guy took. It doesn't feel like that, right. that it's all going to even out. But the truth of the matter is that I played hundreds and thousands of hours of blackjack, and it is a true statement. I've watched people do some of the dumbest things or non-statistically non smart things at a blackjack table, and them making right. that dumb move is what drew a card that would have made the dealer get 21. And as a result, we all won at the table. So it does even out as hard as, as, hard as it yeah, that's true. Yeah, it does even out. And it's funny because sometimes when you press the action, so, you know, if the, the dealer has a six showing, if you want to double down, you know, if you have a, a double down opportunity, you want to take advantage and press that when you have it. And then if you have somebody at the end of the table in the anchor seat that does something you know, non-conventional, like you just mentioned, hitting 16 against the six, and then you lose it, you're like, my God, man. Right. You know, <laughs> that's the time when you can, when you can, you know, ratchet it up when you see that opportunities with the five and the six showing and all that. But, you know, we, man, we can talk about that for days. We got to go no down to Atlantic no City. <laughs> <man. But> I, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, I'm going to let you play the anchor, the anchor, yes, uh, anchor hand. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> man, let's get back to this real quick, brother. I appreciate you, man, for, for sharing this, uh, you know, all of your, your wisdom and your experiences with the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint family. We're not going to hold you too much longer, but I just want to ask you a couple different, a uh, couple more questions. Um, where do you see yourself and your business in so, five years? So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's one of the questions that I constantly challenge myself with. So I'm be honest with you, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, we, we talked, you know, we're, we're friends outside of this interview. I'm a slacker. I'm a slacker. Right. You know, I, I am a slacker <laughs> to the 20th power. I have realized I read a lot of books and listen to a lot of audio books. I'm always trying to sharpen the sword. And what I come to conclude, I listened to this book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. Talks about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. I realized that I have been burdened my entire life with the fixed mindset. I always have believed that I, I believe in innate ability. And I guess that's because God blessed me with so much innate ability. Um, I went, I, I started off by saying I went to 13 different schools in Philly for my education in the Philly public school system. And I was truant almost all the time. I never went to school basically, but yet, you know, and you, right. you know me, it's going to sound cocky for those who don't know me. I'm one of the smartest cats I know, you know, which is why I'm counting cards and going yeah. actuarial science. Where did that come from? Where did that come That's from? Right. If, if, if I never went to school, where did that come from? That came from God. That was an innate ability. And so I've always, and I'm big as hell. That's how I became a bodyguard. That's how I became a football player. All of the things that happened in my life happened because of some God giving ability. So I've always kind of, we see the world as we are perception is reality. I've always believed you don't work to get better at things. You do what you're good at. I played football because I was good at football right. naturally. I tried playing baseball. As soon as I struck out the first time, I said, this ain't for me. I didn't say, let me stay in a batting cage for 15 hours a day until I get good at it. I don't believe in that. I believe in doing what you're good at. Well, there is some, there is some uh, statistical studying that shows that that's a good idea to do that. But for the most part, successful people are people who overcome their shortcomings and work hard at getting better at things, even the things that they're already good at. They work hard at getting better at them. I've never been that guy. 
So that is what I'm really focusing all my efforts on right now is being the best version of me that I can possibly be. If that happens in five years, I see myself. So there's a thing called a paradigm shift. You know, you can operate on a certain mm-hmm. curve, but then you can move the curve. I see myself moving the curve over the last 20 years. God has blessed me. I've been, I can't even, you know, I can't give, give the man of fears enough of credit for what's going on in my life from growing up thinking money was white and being on food stamps over the last 20 years, I've made over $5 million. And whereas that's okay money, it ain't no real money. I was at a conference last week and the number one producer at the firm that I was at the conference for did $3 million last year. So multiply that times 20, 20 years, that's $60 million. I realized that I fly first class, but I want to fly on a private jet. I realize that I go on vacations, but I want vacation homes. I realize that my kids go to schools, but I want them going to the top 10 schools and to Harvard for college. So I need to shift my paradigm financially, which can be done as an entrepreneur. One of the things I've always told people when I tout being an entrepreneur is that if I wake up tomorrow and decide that in 2019, I need a race or a, a Rolls Royce Phantom or whatever they're called, that all I got to do is put pen to paper mm-hmm. and divide out what I make an hour, how many hours I have to do this, how many appointments I got to go on, and there's a number I can shoot for to get my Rolls Royce. If I have a job and a salary, no matter how good I do that job, I'm still going to get that same salary. I don't have that option. So for, for me in five right. years, I see myself, having transformed Charles M. Harris Financial Services into the leading financial literacy and monetary excellence company in the United States. I see me having a legion of advisors that I have trained because you can't trade dollars for minutes and become a a billionaire. You have to leverage yourself. So I need to, to rise up an army of little tanks and send them out here and get them educating our communities and beyond financially and benefiting from that myself financially so that in five years I see myself doing about $10 million a year in revenue instead of doing $250,000 a year. That was a great detailed answer, man. Now, I wanted to ask you because I want the BEB family to, to listen closely. I know that you have a certain avatar of an ideal customer. Can you tell us what is your avatar of a customer and what do you look for somebody that, that you work with or what types of, of individuals? My, do you my work with? ideal client is someone who is open minded to the concept of being financially secure and independent, who wants to have at least five million dollars when they retire, at least. And it doesn't matter where we start today. As long as you are committed to learning what needs to be done to get to that point and willing to do those things, you're an ideal client for me. My sweet spot is small business owners. I do a lot of business succession planning, teaching people how most small business owners, biggest asset is their small business. And then a lot of times it's not easily monetizable. They can't turn it to the cash they want to turn it to day one. So I do a lot of work with small business owners, teaching them how to monetize their business and prepare for the transition from being an entrepreneur to being retired and, and, and being out of that particular business. So I do buy, sell, I do key man. I teach people how to bank on uh, tax-free products so that they can finance themselves when banks don't give them what they need. And I also work in the rollover market with people right now. We have more baby boomers uh, retiring every day than ever before. And the assets are changing hands for people who really are not qualified to teach people about the sequence of return risk in retirement. You know, you ask the people who retired in 2008 how they're doing because their portfolio got hit with a 40% loss day one versus somebody who retired in 2009 and had a 32% uptick. I teach people how to protect their downside while still getting growth. And my ideal clients are small business owners and, and people who are rolling over assets, whether they switch jobs, or are about to retire. All right. So BEB family, if you fall into any of those categories or just want information, we're going to let 
Brother Tank give his information before we sign off. But I do want to bring something up real quick, Tank. In terms of entrepreneurship, now, a lot of people don't know that you can use some of your retirement funds to invest in different vehicles. Can you expound on yeah, that so a little bit? What you have now is that a lot of IRAs, excuse me, a lot of 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans, they have a, uh, what's the word I want to use? A caveat. They have they have a, a clause in, a component, component or a clause or. in them that allows you to self-direct. You can take a portion of those funds and self-direct them. And self-directed IRAs have a lot more flexibility and freedom than the plans we see at our, at our workplace. Uh, those particular plans can be invested in real estate, entrepreneurial endeavors, any type of activity. Now, what I do warn people is there's a lot more risk involved when you're doing those types of things. And you want to make sure you're working with an advisor, shameless plug, like myself. Um, to make sure that you're doing the right things. But I've, I've helped quite a few of my clients take some of their assets from their traditional 401k plans and do self-directed 401k, self-directed IRAs. I was talking to one of my cousins the other day who uh, makes a lot of money in the banking industry, and he wanted to get into real estate he, he's dabbled in it, but I'm like, dude, you know, if you talk to the right person, you can use some of those retirement funds and help finance your multi-unit property that you're looking to buy. And so he was like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. So I just wanted you to expound on that. And I appreciate that because a lot of people don't know that. So you can use those funds. Once again, you got to work with a trusted advisor, somebody that knows what they're talking about, like my brother Charles Tank Harris right here. Brother Tank, I got two more things for you real quick, man. Number one, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add that, we didn't come. I would, man. One thing that I want to say, and we talked about this um, the last time we saw each other in person, you know, the environment that we live in right now, politically, financially, and socially, is, is we are at a crossroads as a country, as a society, as a people. The racial wealth gap in this country is bigger than it's ever been. Home ownership is lower today for African Americans than it was when um, the fair housing. Uh, act was first initiated. And for most African Americans, their primary residence is their biggest asset. And I have committed myself. So once again, I work with, with high net worth clients, but I also work with people who are just getting started because I have a team and my team helps me with my introductory clients, so to speak. It is, it is just something that I, I wave the flag at and I, I stand on my soapbox for. Get started today financially. Whether you have absolutely no money in the bank and you got debt up to your eyeballs, let's construct a plan to start to reduce that debt and grow your assets. Even someone like myself who works with millionaires, I have people on my team, new, new agents, new advisors on my team that learn directly at my knees how to work with you and they bring their hard cases to me for help call reach out and i will make sure that if i'm not working with you personally that i put you with somebody that will help you get on the path i got you know a rising tide rises all boats and sinks all boats and as they say in sports you're only as strong as the weakest person in your team i believe as a people we will only be doing as well as those of us who are in the lower quartile bring themselves up to do and i am challenging all advisors in this space to help those who normally they wouldn't help because a lot of brokerage firms turn their nose up at clients with under a hundred thousand dollars in assets. I am, I came to New York life to work with them on my investment side because they allow clients of all economic backgrounds to come on board. Now I deal more with the higher end, but I still get my eyeballs on the lower end when I'm helping the, the other advisors on my team work with the guys. Like we talked about earlier, brother, that's, that's service. Once again, BEB family, if you have any questions or concerns, Tank, I'm going to let you give out your information before we close on out. Give us all your contact information, man, and the best way to uh, or process. OK, so I'm Charles Tank Harris. I have offices in three states. I'm in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, which is in the greater New York area. I am in Dalla Kinwood, which is in the greater Philadelphia area. I also have an office in Mount Laurel, which is also the greater Philadelphia area. And then my third office is down in Roswell, Georgia, which is the greater Atlanta area. I can be reached by email at Harris, 
H A R R I S C for Charles M for Maurice Harris C M at F like Frank T like Tomorrow dot New York Life dot com. That's Harris C M at F T dot New York Life dot com. But the best way to reach me is by cell phone six zero nine four zero five zero seven seven five. My phone is always blowing up. It's always ringing. This is only going to make it blow up more. So please be prepared to get a voicemail and know that if you leave me a detailed voicemail, I do manage my time. So I have a, a period in time every day that I do nothing but return phone calls. So you will get called back in 24 hours. Now, I just want to let the BEB family know, uh, Brother Tank is licensed in more than those states. So I, we went over it the other day. I think you're in about, what, 18, yeah, 19 I think states was, I, or Yeah, I think you Something opened like my that. eyes when I read the list of states out. I think it's, I think it's 22 <laughs> states I'm licensed in. I'm not, yeah, it's crazy. Like and um, and I got to add four more this week. So um, I, I was at a conference in Orlando, That's and I met stuff. some people from various states that I wasn't licensed in. And I'm adding those this, this upcoming week uh, on Nyper.com is where I add my, my uh, licenses. So, yeah, it doesn't matter where you are hearing this. Uh, you talk to me and, and your story – is uh fits my my profile for client usage and i'll get registered in your state and start making your life better brother charles tank harris i got one more What's question that, for you man this is a surprise okay, okay, question brother. What's good? <laughs> if you had the opportunity to talk to one person living or dead who would it be wow why? that's that's an amazing question and i have to say that the brother i referenced earlier ag gaston um i would want to talk to ag gaston I find I've, I've been studying, like I said, I listen to books all the time because I'm in my car a lot. I find it amazing how African-Americans were able to start to build wealth in America during Reconstruction, when you could literally still be hung, when you could literally, A.G. Gaston had his business blew up three separate times, and they wouldn't extend them homeowners yep. insurance or business insurance to rebuild it. He literally just had to start from scratch again and rebuild it. I can't. I, I say this all the time, and I hope nobody takes offense to this. We are a weaker breed of black people than they were back then because we're comfortable now. They didn't gave us, you know, stuff. Everybody got a cell phone, got a little crib, little car, and we're not fighting like we used to fight. These cats back Reconstruction, That's right. whoo, they, they had it bad. Bombs in the crib, just, just ridiculousness going on. And yet we had millionaires. If we were to, you know, account for inflation, we had almost billionaires back then. I would want to talk to A.G. Gaston. He exactly. was the first black man to make a vertically integrated business. He started selling final expense insurance and then said, you know what? I want to do the funerals. You know what? I want to have the cemetery plot. He built the whole vertically integrated platform for handling death uh, in his community. And I would love to just, just hear any, any he, he was tied in with everybody else. So he chilled with Dr. King and, and the great Mont Booker T. Washington. So in meeting with him, I could also get all the other great African-American heroes in, in my heart and mind, get some understanding of them as well. So that would be the guy I'd want to sit down with. Excellent answer. And it's funny. I'm here here in my office recording this show. I'm looking at the book right now. Black Titan, A.G. Gaston and the Making of a yep. Black Millionaire. And brother, before we close out, you hit on something that I talk about all the time, and it's about building vertical businesses. And anybody who hasn't read this book is called Black Titan. It's about A.G. Gaston. Definitely go pick it up on Amazon or at your local bookstore. It's an amazing read. And I, I definitely agree with you in terms of what those brothers and sisters, Madam C.J. Walker, you know, A.G. Gaston, all of these people went through in a time where, as you mentioned, we could be hung. Now we have the world at literally at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so big on e-commerce right now. There's no reason, absolutely no reason why you're not selling something online. I don't care what it is, right. because that's the future. 50 percent of sales on, <laughs> right now in the United States come from Amazon yep. itself. And so if you're not moving forward, that's why my, my new book, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses, is what I'm talking about. So just imagine what these people had to deal with our forefathers and our ancestors had to deal with and become a millionaire. And like Tank said, in today's economy, they probably be yep. close to billionaires, not if billionaires. not billionaires. And we're sitting here and we're sitting here with all the tools, the, the knowledge, you get the know-how by doing, 
and you have the tools right at your fingertips and we're sitting here mm-hmm. complaining brother you speak in my language right there with that vertical business man i talk about that all the time brother tank i want to thank you so much man for imparting your wisdom and you are smarter <laughs> than i thought man i didn't know that but uh nah let me say <laughs> that i appreciate that Impart, <laughs> imparting that wisdom and your experiences as an entrepreneur so once again beb family you got any questions please reach out to my brother he will definitely take care of you i can vouch for him i love him that's my brother known him for years and i'm glad i finally got him on the show man i appreciate you brother and thank you so I much i love what you're doing for our through. community man and for business in general and i appreciate everything thanks for having me man and it was a great experience and i hope i can come back in the future most definitely when you when you hit that billion dollar mark a you billy a billy back. a billy no doubt <laughs> i talk to you later jay that was my man charles tank harris founder of charles m harris financial services and he just laid it down family Oh, man, there's so many takeaways here, but I'm just going to touch on a few. Uh, when I asked him about the thing, three things that he would uh, pieces of advice he would give to entrepreneurs. Number one, he said, find something that you're passionate about. Uh, number two, find a need and fill it. And number three, do something that betters the world. And I really like that last one, because as I said before, guys, we're here to serve. You got to find out who you want to serve. And determine how you're going to serve them. But that's really what we're here for. Our experiences aren't just for us. They're for others to learn and to share those experiences. So that was very profound. And he also said something that that was really profound. He said, you know, uh, we're taught that success begets happiness. But it doesn't. Seek out happiness and you're more likely to obtain a higher level of success. I'm going to repeat that. We're taught that success begets happiness, but it does not seek out happiness. uh, When you seek out happiness, you're more likely to obtain a higher level of success. Basically, it's talking about people define success as monetary, but it's not that. So that was something very profound. And also, when you're doing something that you love or you're passionate about or that God put you here to do, you're, you're more likely to sustain when times get hard. So when you're busting your hump and you don't see the money coming in, it's very easy for you to turn and pivot and do something else if you're only in it for the money. But if you're doing something that you know that you're supposed to be doing, that what your calling is, what your passion is, what your assignment is, then you'll be able to walk through and fight through anything to make that come to fruition. So Charles dropped all types of uh, of gems during this interview. I know it was a little longer than normal, but hey, we couldn't stop. When you're getting that good word, you got to keep going with it. So I I appreciate my brother for spending the time and taking time out of his busy schedule to be with the BEB family. Now, before we close out, guys, once again, uh, I say it each and every week, but thank you so much for spreading the word. And please continue to spread the word about the podcast and the blog, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. You know, every week we get more and more downloads and that's attributed to the BEB family. So please Continue to spread the word for me. Um, If you need to connect with me, if it's something long, you know, hit me on my email, jjones at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com, J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com. Facebook, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Twitter, jjones001. Instagram, jjones for real, J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S, the number four, R-E-A-L. YouTube, go to YouTube and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and hit Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. I have additional content that's not on the podcast. So the podcast comes out there every week, but I have additional content that I put up there too. And if you also want to be included into the BEB text line for live notifications and reminders about special events, text BEB to 555-888, BEB to 555 888. Love you guys. I'll see you same time next week. Peace.